you. First of all, um, I'd like to <coughs> I'd like to say a big thank you to the organisers of this event. Um, I'm really, really honoured um, that you're um, connecting my article to um, to this event and the energy that has gone into creating this. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about something, um, and a lot of my work has been some things I've been thinking about and writing about for many years. But the strange thing is that it's very rare, and probably this is the first place where I found a space where I feel that I can just speak <coughs> without any fear, without any kind of censorship about this work, because a lot of the time you feel that you're, um, there's just no space to say these things that I've been thinking about, and that can actually drive you a bit crazy or make you angry. Um, another space I've found is Media Diversified, which has been so such a relief for me to think that whenever I want to write something, there's a space, and something is bubbling in me so much that you know there's a space where I can just send it, and they will accept it. Um, and so these spaces are really special and really important and we can really develop our thinking and ideas and um, critical engagement. Um, as I said at the last talk, the problem can become is that you think so much about these things and then you're connecting with the mainstream and you're thought and interrogated things so much that you enter the mainstream and it's very frustrating that the conversation is on a completely different plane altogether. And, um, in some ways, the talk that I'm giving today is about that, um, uh, that trying to relate to frameworks that have already been created and exist for us, and how we end up, um, I've called it diversity as a dead end. We kind of keep hitting the walls um, in that box, in that framework, um, and it's very limiting. Um, so the title of the talk is Diversity as a Dead End, Reading White Supremacy. Um, on reading white supremacy in literature, film, television, <coughs> and thinking about whiteness as a normative, neutral gaze, which is how it's often um, presented, but also how we can often internalize it as well. So I'm going to be talking not only about how we've been represented, but also how we can internalize that and reproduce that, and multiculturalism and diversity really encourage us to just continue in a certain tradition of representation. Um, so we're not really radically, we think that we are, it's inclusive, but actually we end up just performing to what others want us to do. Um, do you want to...? <coughs> so, um, a starting point um, is this idea of my assumption that I'm beginning with is that art, literature, um, these are all political. And I don't know, to some of you it might seem obvious and it might not to some of you, but a lot of the time the kind of discourse that we hear is about art and literature as something very abstract and sacred, something that's kind of just self-expression, you're just expressing yourself. And then we have this very kind of oppressive freedom of speech, freedom of expression kind of discourse that is thrown around. Um, usually it's thrown around by the powerful when they feel that they, they who usually have a platform and a voice to say whatever they want, to produce whatever they want, and whenever that's questioned, then freedom of expression is kind of thrown around. And it's interesting because um, even, uh, do you know Edward Said, and his, he's written about Orientalism, right? so he has done so much amazing work about um, representations um, of the East by the West, uh, the other othering ideologies, um, which has been so important. But at the same time, even he, as a product of this kind of literature, humanities departments, falls into this kind of myth-making, which we just hear all the time, of literature as something sacred. So on one hand, <coughs> in the two satanic verses, everybody's talking about Islam, and how you know nothing should be sacred. At the same time, the kind of language and, and way of speaking often um, seems to say that literature is sacred. So the kind of you know way that you're you're told that nothing should be sacred, and, and you know this is why you're wrong for complaining. At the same time, you're putting literature on a pedestal as something that's separate from the world and should not be questioned, doesn't have consequences, doesn't put through ideologies. 
So this is a quote by a, a critic called A.J.S. Ahmed um, about the fact that uh, Edward Said has given us such a powerful narrative of literary representations um, as integral to the imperialist systems of power um, and has been so sensitive about the coverage of Islam in the Western media. Actually, when that controversy happened, he was uh, championing, because of the apparent superior sanctity of literature, uh, Rushdie's absolute right to write as he pleases, uh, regardless of the novelist's location in relation to the corporate world of global representations and the British imperial state. So even Edward Said was defending Rushdie's freedom of expression um, as a basis of you know, saying you're not allowed to protest, you're not allowed to question or be critical. <coughs> Sorry. Next slide. Um, this is just a quote from Raymond Williams on Marxism and literature. Just to, um, I won't read it through, but you can just skim through. But just the fact that literature and art is always aligned, it's always located in a certain place, it's a certain perspective that it's showing. Um, again, this point that um, nothing is abstract, nothing exists outside of the world. <coughs> Um, this whole idea of objectivity, neutrality, fidelity to the truth is not um, is not there, but it's a it's a very helpful and useful myth to um, for those who always have the platform and the voice to speak, because it can silence um, any criticism and it can give a kind of uh, authority to whatever you produce, whatever you write. Uh, next one. Thank you. Um, so, to start off with, I wanted to just uh, briefly, we don't have to go through all these clips, but maybe we'll uh, click on some of them. But the, the picture is of, does anybody, can anybody see what it might be referring to? Mm -hmm. Do you know about the exhibit B, uh, Human Zoo, and the whole protest around it? Is there anybody who can uh, tell us a bit about the protest that happened? And I've intentionally put a picture of the protest rather than the actual um, exhibit. I mean, it was there's an artist <coughs> called uh, Bradley Brett, I think that's his name, um, who had this uh, South African white artist who had an exhibition and he was touring around the world and he was going to be showing it at the Barbican very expensive tickets and basically it would be representing um, what he was, he, with good intentions, he was going to be representing this human zoo, so basically showing um, people who are being chained, people in cages, really offensive images and representation, apparently to show the barbarity of this human zoo that used to exist. But, Actually, um, there's this part of a whole history of representation where you don't focus on resistance as well. You want to represent always as a kind of victim or as uh, enslaved, as um, exoticized, as fixed, stereotypical, submissive, so and funny and ridiculous. So just a few. Does anybody ever watch the party by Peter, uh, Peter Sellers? Maybe we can just watch in a tiny little bit. <coughs> this way of speaking that the ing like um, that you also hear in the next clip. Now I don't really ever hear Indians speaking English in this way which has become very um, like you show an Indian person speaking English, especially if they're not <coughs> a 
children are brought up here, and you have a particular way of representing it, with this, you know, using this thing. So if you could just play your uh, mind your language, just a few seconds of that clip. <coughs> Can you be letting me 10 feet? Yes, okay. Thousands and views. But I am making one condition. What is that? I want to hear you say, all Muslims are nice, kind, and most wonderful persons. <laughs> okay, if so I am so saying bad. that, you will be letting me 10 Sorry, just, I mean, this was, did anybody ever watch Mind Your Language? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a very popular TV show. Very. Um, and the way in which it represented, basically, there was the kind of neutral, I mean, that's this, this idea of the kind of neutral, <coughs> very civilized, very patient English teacher who's teaching these foreigners English who are all very stereo, you know, very much stereotyped. My uncle would tell me how that program would lead him to being bullied at school, um, the representations in his television program. Um, and then, just one second of Gone with the Wind. I mean, there's actually countless thousands and thousands of things I could show. You know, that. Bollywood is coming to London this summer as we present once again in Merchants of Bollywood. It's a smash hit show with a fantastic number of dancers on stage. It incorporates a whole variety of dance styles from all over India as well. So, I mean, what you, this is like 2016, but we have seen Bollywood again and again and again. I mean, often it feels like there's nothing to be in South Asian um, except the colour and the glamour and the glitz. Um, of the kind of Bollywood and dance and music. Um, and then Real Bad Arabs, has anybody seen this uh, documentary? I really recommend you watch it if you can. It's just like half an hour, but it's about the history of uh, representation of Arabs in Hollywood, including Disney. It's not clicking, is it? Right? So you have to... Oh, okay. Well, maybe. Leave it. It's fine. No, if you, if you just type in real bad Arabs into um, Google, and uh, I really recommend that you watch this documentary. It kind of really highlights for picking out uh, throughout the history of Hollywood how um, Arab Muslims, Arabs generally have been shown in a certain way, which how that connects to um, basically justifying violence and war. So this is something that Saeed has written about, how representations are, they're not just something to, um, you know, take lightly, because they often, to dehumanize a whole people is what um, justifies then killing them to bomb countries. People can kind of turn a blind eye because what you've been fed again and again and again is images of people as being um, greedy, nasty, fanatical, it's almost like their lives are not worth so much. And then also I recommend if you get a chance to read this article as well, How to Write About Africa, I don't know if anybody's written it, uh, read this, um, about the kind of stereotypes that we see again and again. Uh, we go to the next. So that was just to, to give you a, a kind of little sense of this history, which goes back even further than what I have talked about. It's uh, you know, going back to colonialism, um, the kind of paintings we saw, the kind of ways that people were written about. Um, coming up to the present day, has anybody followed this debate uh, about appropriation? Lydon Shriver? <laughs> so basically she gave a speech um, at the festival and she was talking about how she's 
feeling very uncomfortable and threatened by people talking about cultural appropriation. Basically because it's uh, making her question her right to write about whoever she wants, however she wants. Um, and she's kind of taking uh, recourse to the same idea I talked about at the beginning, which is literature, art, is something that is you know, separate from the world, is, is kind of pure, you're just expressing yourself and you should nothing should disturb you in your right to write whatever you like. Um, so this is just a little quote from that speech. Um, the message seems to be that it's a whole lot safer to make your characters from that same demographic. Um, uh, availing yourself of a diverse class, you're not free. So she's using this idea of freedom. Um, uh, and, and inadvertently, you've invited a host of regulations upon your head. Just having joined the EU, using different races, ethnicities, minority, gender identities, and you are being watched. And she's saying that this climate of scrutiny has got under my skin. Uh, she's remembering the good old days when she started out as a novelist and she didn't hesitate to write black characters and to avail herself of black characters, of which she has a pretty good ear. Um, now she's more anxious um, about writing um, different races. So she got a lot of criticism for this, and I think this is a change which is coming about because mainly because of the internet as well. That I think uh, people are really calling out and questioning um, the right of people to just say whatever they want, to represent however they want, because uh, um, there's a responsibility, and people can see that this is this doesn't ring true. This is offensive. So going back to this idea of art literature is political. Actually, it's not about not being allowed or not having permission to write what you want, but at the same time, you have to be prepared for the consequences as well and to be critiqued because you're writing about real people and real places. I once heard Jim Crace, a writer, talking about some years ago about um, setting some of his stories in a place called Africa. And he said, I just people ask me how I've never been there, and he just said, I just made it up. I think those days are kind of starting to be numbered of, you know, writers having that kind of arrogance, mm -hmm. as if, um, I don't know if any of you know about the Linton, what was her first name? Um, the woman who wrote that memoir about her gal, yeah. She just put a lot of, you know, drama into it. Um, made up things that just were not true. And her book actually had to be withdrawn because of people you know, saying, no, this is false. Earlier, uh, yeah, she would have probably got away with it. <coughs> we go to the next. So, then, as I've been talking about how we've been represented, um, and now I'm going on to talk about how we represent ourselves because. The assumption, and you have like post-colonial literature departments, and, and this whole idea of writing back, um, and it's uh, and people talk about uh, multicultural, you know, multiculturalism with allowed in new voices, and is this kind of celebratory air that you know writers are now writing back. Um, but the truth of it is um, something I've been really thinking about a lot. Is 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 something really radical? Um, happening has, has the things really changed in how we are now writing ourselves? Have we been allowed to um, really challenge in our writing the representations that came before us? Or perhaps that change was starting to happen but it was contained and captured in, for example, this whole discourse of multiculturalism and diversity. I mean, I think we, this conversation is much bigger if we talk about ethnic media, if we talk about literature, if we talk about a period when people were starting to represent themselves in their own platforms that suddenly became kind of captured by the mainstream uh, as kind of multiculturalism and more and more diversity so that um, people started to think oh hey things are good now we're all being included and you know there's a chance for a few of us you know maybe a few of us are getting into the mainstream maybe we all can um, and as I go on, I'm just I'm going to be focusing in particular on British Asian literature because that's what my work has been. But I think that when I talk about could apply 
uh, more widely, but it's a, a kind of case study of what happened to this literature that uh, uh, we are all celebrating and thinking, hey, this is so cool, we're actually writing our own stuff and we've got a place um, in the British literary panel. But actually, that's a picture, so to go back, this is Citizen Khan, and so I think when you, if anybody has seen Citizen Khan, has anybody seen? I think you can kind of understand what I'm talking about if you have seen this, about how we end up caricaturing and ridiculing and internalizing um, a racism. If we watch an episode of this, we won't find that it's so different from Mind Your Language, except it's okay now because we are representing the, you know, the writer and the actors and you can know, say that we're doing this ourselves. So. Um, fitting ourselves into ready-made boxes. So these are just some of the ways in which uh, we end up doing this kind of, uh, um, I was talking about diversity um, and multiculturalism as these boxes that we fit, um, or frames that we end up fitting ourselves into. Um, so commodification is, is one of those, or funding. Um, a lot of the time, what um, I have seen, and I think I, my perspective partly comes because I you was in England my whole life, and then I went to India for five years, and I came back to England. And I think it just started to get me seeing things in a slightly different way and wondering, is something a bit weird going on in this country? I think if I you know watch these shows and I watch like people performing and stand up, if I read these funding bids, it just seems, because that culture is not quite there in that way, that things are not prescribed so much, it seemed to me that actually most of the time, as artists and writers, we're kind of doing this constant dance of responding to what other people want us to do. So if you could just go on. This is just a picture of the, of the front covers of South Asian books, which you know, the similarities of them. And this is just representing this commodification of literature which goes beyond the marketing and how something is presented um, but also within what is written as well I mean the marketing what sells decides what is commissioned publishers agents actually directly approach um, often people or maybe journalists say can you write this book or this is you know we need some books on terrorism maybe you could write about um, what a good Muslim you are and this problem that exists. Or, um, so this commodification of literature is not just about the packaging and selling of books, but it starts at the very beginning. Um, and then funding commissions, workshop events, um, which is what I was just talking about. Did anybody see this exhibition? Did you, what were your thoughts about this exhibition? Does anybody have anything that they might share about what they thought? I, I knew some of the people that were involved. Mm -hmm. In essence, I thought it was a, a good thing at the beginning. Right? I thought, great. What it turned out into for me was that it was kind of like a way of saying, look, Look how much these people did to help us, and, and look how great they were, without really like <laughs> going into the effects of um, that that time, the experience after that, many British Sikhs living in the UK, um, and actually a lot of what happened post that time in India and in the UK. It just sort of um, made it shiny made it really nice mm -hmm. and um, and I have to admit like I had to check myself a few times because part of me was kind of like oh oh this is so good look it they, they've said something and then I was like yeah but this my whole dissertation was uh, was about um, was about uh, violence in India and in the wars and the effect on the diaspora and community and I had to keep checking myself to be kind of like no 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 this is not the whole story, it's not even close to the whole story, it's a black, nice shiny version that feels acceptable to come and walk around and look at some pictures and go, well the Sikhs are right, and the other problem with it was, 
is it also was that it was like the mm. Sikhs are all right, they yeah. did a lot for us, yeah. and it's kind of like at the same time we're trying to say that other people didn't. So I never saw like the Muslims in World War One, but and people do this a lot. People, like I'll see it on I'll see it on profiles where I'll see someone say, "Oh, um, you guys are all right." Yeah. Like no, no, you guys are all right, and it, it's, the, it's the Muslims that are the problem. We like the Sikhs. So this was I think funded by was it the lottery? The uh, I think was so, also yeah. the Punjab Heritage. <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of money, a lot yeah, of funding. Got a lot of money. And uh, what you're saying is right because this Punjabi is also deceiving because actually there were far more Punjabi Muslim soldiers who died yeah. in the First World War than Sikh. So there's definitely a lot of that going on as kind of good citizens and you know, versus bad citizens. But also, as you kind of said, this, and this is what I'll come to with British Asian literature as well, the kind of underlying narrative is of British citizenship and loyalty to the British nation. Um, so, you know, forget colonialism and everything that you know, Britain did, but actually um, this is a kind of whole exhibition about the extent of our loyalty. Look, we were British citizens even back then. And we were dying in these large numbers for this war. So just as there's a larger kind of set, you know, memorial of um, the First World War and, and people who died, we also are inserting ourselves into that narrative. So it's about the team British. So it, it, is also, it also even deeper perpetuates the, the racism <coughs> that is between communities. Mm -hmm. Because even in, so in, take it out of the UK context, in the US post 9 11 hate crimes, mm -hmm. um, Sikhs didn't know how to talk about it. So the Sikhs were like, you targeted the wrong people, mm -hmm. and it's like, no, 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 that's not the point. They haven't targeted the wrong people. Nobody should be getting killed post 9 11 because of who they are. So it was like, you killed a Sikh because you thought it was a Muslim, yeah. and the Sikhs did, did, didn't know that. Like, there was no literacy in how to understand this. So it's not underneath it, it perpetuates these kind of, like, this, there's this hierarchy of yeah. how British or how American you are. and according to which background you're from, we give you a little bit more respect than we give other people. And, and then I found the Punjab community really quite almost buy into mm -hmm. that. I have to then have some people to come and question that as well. So there's so many layers of it that, that you start to conform to if you're not keeping an eye on what's happening. And we saw some of that even in that short mind your language clip of that kind of, you know, dividing of communities. Um, I don't know if you would be able to possibly, I uh, you know these clips here, you might be able to cut and paste them into uh, uh, so I don't know why they're not yeah, I mean I can just talk about them the first one is, uh, is Shaheen here Shaheen, when I gave the talk um, at the last um, uh, event here that it was something that uh, you mentioned which I think just typifies this kind of, I was talking about being a bit like, you know, there's this kind of alienation that's going on of ourselves because we're constantly performing ourselves. So when you go to these events, it's like, you, who are they for? Who are they directed towards? The way that they're written about and represented. So Shaheen actually mentioned this because we were talking about festival like Alchemist. And the way in which it's like this presentation of the South Bank of South Asian culture, but it's, it's framed in a very, strange way and everybody who's part of it as well it's you have to kind of perform yourself i met the organizer actually and i was asking him he just did not get it but you know imagine if you have a workshop on how to make fish and chips <laughs> but he just seemed to think it's a very positive yeah, about that star on my head scarf i wrote a response to it so i'll be happy to sorry that. i wrote a response to oh you wrote it. a response to it um, okay so i'm happy to share that if yeah, that would be great. Um, <coughs> I'm suddenly thinking, are we okay for time? Uh, yeah, we're um, About 10 15 minutes left. Um, including discussion? Uh, what we might do is move the discussion if you want to discuss elsewhere, because uh, there's going to be another talk in the podcast. Okay. It's like a much bigger presentation, but I just uh, pack it in. But you know, how is this uh, uh, here? This lively uh, panel discussion of pressures of big Asian weddings. Is that this year? 
we just go back to actually the uh, next page? Or well, actually this Bali Theatre. So this is a we're talking about commissions and funding and how they often already decided what they want and what they're looking for and so you're supposed to just respond to that. So this is one which I came across, which is a uh, you know, like maybe we don't want to write about honor killings. Is that the only thing that we have to write about? That we, we don't have a choice? Um, so this is Dali Theta, and it's, you know, produces a lot of good and interesting work, but at the same time, there, it's just it's what we see across the board. Or it's already been decided for us what we should write about, what we should explore. There's just no freedom at all for us to actually you know, write something else and, and we get into the habit of constantly on this, you know, dance and performance because you're responding to funding bids and you're responding to commissions and trying to do what others want you to do. Do you go to the next one? Um, so this is just a few quotes of from... Um, there were just a, a few quotes just talking about um, um, I was talking about the different ways in which we are kind of in a frame, in a way. And like I, we talk about stereotypes, but it goes deeper than that. It's actually about ideology, and it's about us fitting ourselves into a certain ideology. And the way in which ideology works is that it evolves and it changes and it takes a different form. But fundamentally, that dominant ideology stays the same. So. It looks like there's a space, there's some, you know, coloured people being represented in some way. But if we're actually just telling the same um, kind of stories, which are of, you know, the importance of being British and what being British involves, kind of identifying with whiteness, um, it's often about secularism, um, it's often about um, this idea of what it is to be normal, um, modern. So these are just a few, uh, uh, two quotes about how uh, often what, what is written ties in with a, a nation's dominant um, ideology. Could we go on to the next one? Um, I'm talking about British Asian writing. These are just some of the, the book covers. Um, I just want to highlight like the boy with the top knot. I talked about this last time as well. And how it's really odd to talk, have a title like the boy with the top knot, and it? it's immediately othered as something exotic, odd, strange. And the whole narrative of this memoir, very popular, it's been described as kind of, you know, uh, a really important part of, you know, British um, writing. Um, the whole point is that he, how he becomes British, so he grows up in Wolverhampton, and he's writing about how he um, changes over time and he ends up going to getting a government assisted place in a private school, um, he ends up going to I think, Oxford, becomes a, a journalist in London, and there's two kind of turning points in this narrative. One of them is when he cuts his hair and it's presented as this great liberatory moment that he, um, you know, it's after that he suddenly is not bullied at school, and we'll have a quote later on. Um, could you just run ahead, actually, quickly? But there's a quote about how um, uh, he actually says that by my Ranjit, uh, the tube work, the days were over. So he actually identifies himself with Ranjit from Mind Your Language <coughs> and says that, thank God, I'm not like Ranjit anymore, who. Um, A bit further, sorry. We're just not going to have time to go through all of this, but I just <laughs> that, that, that was one back there, sorry. Top knot turban. Um, so these are the kind of prologue in Jeet Singh, the Punjabi tube worker, um, from Mind Your Language. And these are just quotes from some different texts about this the top knot and turban and how it's always presented in all these works as kind of oppressive and you need to get rid of it in order to fit in and assimilate. It's not problematized that why should you be made to suffer and why should you endure that racism because you have that. It's just kind of taken for granted. The parents are the oppressive ones who are making you have that and, and it goes as it's part of this whole narrative 
that we see again and again and again, which always focuses on the reverse racism of the families um, and very little about the racism of the society that you're living in. So it's always the parents who are forcing you to have an arranged marriage and marry somebody who's the same religion and same background as you. So going back to the boy with the top knot, the second um, key kind of turning point in that memoir is when he manages to convince his mom that he will not have an arranged marriage and he would um, only, and it seems like he's only interested in marrying a white middle class woman. <laughs> that is another thing in all of his works. There's a real obsession with white middle class woman as, you know, the, like it's not as if he's trying to convince his mom that he will marry someone of a different, you know, race, Muslim woman, a, a black woman, a woman of a different caste. It's, he hasn't even got a girlfriend, but it's just a student. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever he has a relationship with or marry, she will be a white middle class woman. And you see, I mean, in tourism, you've got this brown, sinister kind of hand when, you know, in front of this woman. You have the same in Sofras and Azul, which is a kind of post-77, good Muslim narrative, <coughs> pointing out uh, um, how he is separate and different from those bad Muslims who do things like uh, terrorist attacks um, and also how oppressive his family is and how he needs to get away from them. Um, sorry if we could go forward. Um, I mean I've gone through, sorry, the next one. Uh, I'm just talking about the state here and the market because they kind of end up tying together. So the, the pressure on writers and it can be internalized so it might not be experienced as a work pressure but it's not a coincidence that it's the same kind of thing being written again and again and again and published and celebrated and those voices being given a platform and it's both the pressure of the state that you have to be the good immigrant or the good Muslim and show your loyalty to the British um, nation um, but also publishers and what their idea of what sells which is their own you know, they also share that ideology and way of thinking. One of the things I've uh, been writing about is how the response to these works is also very revealing. So the fact that nobody notices this, that these works are just racist. Um, there's a lot of internalized shame and self-loathing, <coughs> including academics, including post-colonial academics, including liberal reviewers, both white and non-white, um, actually reveals their racism and their internalized idea of what it is to be normal um, and how that racism then becomes invisibilized because kind of you know their own racism is connecting with the racism in the book and it's not even seen. Sorry, could we go to the next one? Um, I just want to give you a sense of some of the quotes, just in case you don't believe me. <laughs> um, so this is the, in uh, the boy with the top knot talking about um, uh, the, these immigrants. I mean, you, you, that's the kind of thing you'd read in like the Daily Mail, you'd think, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's Sir Fraz Manzoor talking about these, uh, these uh, bloody immigrants who uh, just want to have a, a, a marriage here to, to get a citizenship in this country. Sorry, could we go to the next one? Um, part of this ideology that I'm talking about is a sense of progress and what it is to move forward and the direction in which there's a kind of inevitability that we all have to move in this direction towards becoming British, which means leaving our religion and customs and languages behind um, in order to become normal. So these works carry that kind of assumption that these um, uh, that in a way the parents have started a journey which they are continuing so that journey starts in a village in Punjab um, and then they maybe grow up in a place like Wolverhampton which is also presented as a kind of back of beyond kind of equivalent of that backward village in um, India or Pakistan and they travel from that village to um, London to via Oxford or something or you know, a university um, and there's a sense that you have to convince your parents to come along with you on that journey. But the truth of it is, <coughs> the next one, that actually those parents will never be able to join you in that place because they'll never 
that acceptance and Britishness, as we all know, is conditional. It's conditional on speaking English, it's conditional on dressing in a certain way and thinking a certain way. So what these books, if you do a kind of counter-reading of the books, which I've been doing, is also about the violence of becoming British and how these, these writers actually have had to, they've really had to, they've internalised a lot of shame and loathing. They've got a really traumatic, traumatised kind of journey, relationship with their families, um, because there is no, ex they have to, they have to conform to being in a certain way to be accepted and then they kind of instinctively know that their families can never, even if they learn English, they'll still never be the kind of British um, citizens. Uh, go on to the next one, sorry. Um, so I've, what I've been uh, talking about is how these books are very sly because they're presented as being multicultural, as representing the other, and they do this in this uh, very sly way of having a kind of normative voice of the narrator who is a kind of normal British westernized uh, almost like a native informant who's taking you through this journey sharing where he or she but usually it's a he often has come from at the same time the way that they represent um, difference and they represent their families um, is uh, no different to how they've been represented in all those representations I was talking about in the beginning. Um, so like music, this, this is what music is, this is Springsteen, um, being grateful to the, the country, this country for the opportunities it's given you, if you go on. Um, so the next one. Um, so if you could just skim through these quotes, this is how, for example, the parents are described and that kind of ridiculing, that kind of, they're always, which is what I see as a white gaze that you're having upon your own family when you're describing them. Um, and not just your family, but other people in your community. And we have seen this again and again. We've seen it in East Disease. We've seen it in... There's often a lot of misogyny there as well. I don't know if you remember, like, for example, East is East and the two women that they're supposed to be marrying in that arranged marriage scenario. You see that in all of these works, actually, that kind of uh, misogyny as well. We're really running out of time, aren't we? Okay, don't um, just so people know, what, what we're going to do is start the workshops um, at the end of this talk. And, um, the, so you're not missing out on loads of stuff. Well, there'll be a break. You can remove and then remove these tablets, which will start with the next book. So carry on with this. Okay, I'll just, I'll just be a few more minutes. Um, this is some of the uh, sorry, if you could go back. Um, this is the way that uh, this uh, mother is described in uh, Milka Daliwal's tourism. Um, and then Daljit Nagra as well. If we could just go forward, sorry. Another one. Another one. <coughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, so also talking about English as well and the English language and how, I mean, are, aren't we so tired of hearing that funny Indian accent? If, you, if somebody's speaking in another language, it's not really necessary that you have to present them as, playing, as speaking a funny, you know, ridiculous English accent to kind of represent that they're speaking in, you know, you make people sound like they're stupid and if they're speaking in their own language, that doesn't mean that they're going, you know, they're stupid. Um, and these writers kind of end up, um, I, they express their frustration that their parents don't learn English, um, which is just their parents' laziness. I've been exploring the idea that actually it's a form of resistance, actually, that the parents who are presented in these works as being um, backward and not integrating and and actually, perhaps what they're doing is resisting uh, British hegemony, and they're resisting actually uh, this idea that you have to be, um, you know, you have to speak English, you have to leave your culture and your religion behind. And I think a lot of young people also relate and connect to these um, uh, histories and cultures and faiths in a way that is not represented in mainstream uh, literature on television. 
uh, we could go. So this is a quote from Daljit Navra's um, poem. Would you have to just play this clip just for a second? Um, and it's the, he also writes in this kind of way um, to, to kind of create an Indian English. somebody who, you know, a South Asian who can't speak English properly, which doesn't really correspond to the way that um, Sing song. I run just one of my daddy's shops from nine o'clock to nine o'clock and he wants me not to have a break. But with nobody in, I do the lock. Cause up the stairs is my newly bride. We share in chapati, we share in the chutney, after we had made a love like we're rowing through Putney. When I return. But you get a sense, Daljit Nagra is like the South Asian poet who is taught in school syllabuses. And you know he's doing this kind of self-parody and performative, again not so different from mind your language. He's just is it a coincidence that he is so celebrated and it seems like he's the only South Asian poet around. <laughs> um, and this is just, the, the, I mean, often it's very subtle as well, this kind of uh, representation in these works. Uh, this is a very overt quote in Sir Fazan Zul's memoir about, you know, him, he's, he's very overt, like showing his anger at those bad Muslims. But these quotes are. Um, in a, a book called Owls Are the Streets show how this can be quite subtle as well because it's a book that seems to be showing you know, the narrative of somebody becoming radicalised and, um, uh, and trying to explain it but at the same time the way in which Islam is represented or the Muslim woman, his mom is just like, she's only depicted as this woman who just walks around ghost-like in a niqab and all you see are her eyes um, she never. She seems to wear it all the time in the house as well. And, um, <laughs> I could tell by the way her niqab was fluttering in her mouth that she was breathing hard. <laughs> it's it's actually mocking her, but in a way that nobody notices and nobody has picked it up. Um, it because the book is supposed to be presenting that you know Muslim perspective. And the last point is just about. How it's, it's very complicated as well because they are talking about their families. So there is some attachment and affection which comes through in the works as well, which is why my understanding is that this is a form of writers seem to me to be deeply traumatized and deeply damaged um, by, you know, they're a product of this uh, education system, of uh, the media in this country, of everything giving them this message that their families, where they've come from, is um, inferior and shameful, and they've internalized that, but there's a, they're kind of torn because they have some attachment to their families. It's not like a complete stranger who's representing in this way, completely dehumanized. Um, and my last point, just to wrap up, is just thinking about what are the alternatives uh, going forward. One alternative which I come across whenever I try to, often when I try to speak about this, is I'm not a British Asian writer, I'm just a writer. Um, and it's this idea of, you know, let's not talk about this, this is boring now. And, and actually I just want to erase anything South Asian from my writing. And often it becomes the same thing of an internalised shame and inferiority. And you just want to kind of, you know, and, and you think that being simply a writer is the kind of superior, um, Thing to be, but writer is not a neutral term, it's loaded, and it's often to be a writer is to write like a white, middle class, male, heterosexual writer. So, this is a kind of you know, you're not really going to get around this problem by just brushing it under the carpet and saying, um, I'm just a human, I'm just a writer, <laughs> um, all lives matter. <laughs> um, and the other thing is also, which I think sometimes I'm a bit concerned about, these conversations that we have, is that we don't want to also idolise 
we know that where we come from, our families, our cultures, there are problems. I mean, in South Asian families, there's past that comes up in these books. It's a real problem. There's you know, racism within South Asian races. Racism exists towards black people. Um, there are a lot of problems. Do we, do we just brush those on the carpet and just present nice <coughs> images of, you know, positive images? Uh, and I don't think that's the answer either. I think it's something I've been exploring through my own writing, that perhaps one way of dealing with this is thinking very deeply about who we write for. Because in all these books that I've been talking about, it's very clear that they are written for white readers, mm -hmm. white audiences. And it's like, if you, did, if you dissect that work, it's, it's very obvious. And I think that if we just make a very radical shift, and it involves a lot of interrogation and work, because we have internalized everything we read is written for white readers. So we will just reproduce that. We have to do a lot of thinking and undoing, and think, I'm going to write for the people that I'm writing about. And how does that change my writing? So a lot of the time when we talk about um, uh, doing something different, we think we need or being political. It's about you know writing about politics in a very overt way. There's something as, as subtle as just changing the direction in which you face. And then you know when you write for people who that you're writing about for your communities, you will write about the racism within. You will write about the patriarchy within. You write about the problems, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the love, the affection, the bonds. But you'll do it with compassion and investment, and you'll do it from a, a you know a place where you're actually making a difference because you know that this is your your audience and you care about <laughs> what you're writing about. So that's just my suggestion for how you know we could do things differently. And I'm really sorry that was very long. <laughs> Thank you.